Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about families and social class. In the last lecture, we talked extensively about this because to really understand the association between race and ethnicity and the family, we have to really understand the in association between race, ethnicity, and social class. And social class is defined as a group within the class system. And the class system can be divided in any numerous ways. You could just do, you know, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the upper class and the lower class, or the upper class, the owners, or the property owners, and then the lower class, the working class, or the property lists. Um, you can subdivide it into you know, some societies have a middle class, and then that middle class can be further even then subdivided. And so again, social classes themselves are actually arbitrary groups of people. Again, it's us who decide, you know, what social class somebody is in based upon some kind of a measure. Um, and when you go to measure social class, the generally the easiest way to do it is to think about it like a math equation, measuring basically someone's socioeconomic status, their social location within the class system. And then that location can be grouped together with other, you know, people to create a social class. But it's education plus your job prestige plus your wealth plus your, you know, cultural capital or social capital, you know, so... And then all that is associated with your race and ethnicity and religion and all kinds of multifaceted factors. So when you go to measure somebody's socioeconomic status, again, the most important factors, again, are going to be your education, your job, and your wealth. But how do you get the education, job, and wealth? Is your ability to get an education and a job associated with your biological sex? Because historically, somebody who was female, for example, was not even allowed to get an education, let alone become like a doctor, a lawyer, or an elite politician. And same thing was for African Americans. African Americans were not allowed to be in managerial positions. They were not allowed to be in positions where they could get capital and then accumulate capital so that their family can rise up the social class ladder, for example. So again, when it comes to social class, there are a ton of factors that have to be considered. And again, I guess you need a little bit of an understanding of capitalism and that capitalism is an economic system and the goal of capitalism is to consolidate power and capital into the hands of the few. Therefore, races were created so we could you know, reduce competition and subjugate people in the lower classes. Um, patriarchal attitudes, you know, male-dominated attitudes, you know, they support males being in elite positions and then oppress, you know, females. So again, traditional ideologies that, you know, expected women to stay home, for example, tend to lean toward less progressive attitudes toward women's rights, for example. And again, so, you know, women were restricted. All the minorities were historically restricted from rising up the social class ladder. But again, this is very important when it comes to the family because your family's socioeconomic status, your family's location within the social class system is then associated with the family's overall life chances, your access to getting an education and a good job and some money and being able to get, you know, some friends in elite positions and the whole social networking thing that is involved with social and cultural capital and whatever it might be. But just simply your ability to rise up the social class ladder, okay? And so historically in America, which families had the you know easiest time rising up the social class ladder? And that would be, you know, white families that, you know, had, you know, some status to begin with that weren't born into poverty, okay? Because again, rising up the social class ladder, you might think it's easy and anyone can do it in America. But as your book points out, W.E.B. Du Bois was an African-American with a PhD from Harvard. And he was looking at the American dream and he's like, it's not for me because I'm black. And so the realization of that was very disillusioning and led to an entire, you know, movement of people, of course. But you got to think about how America has historically been a racist and sexist and ethnocentric and, you know, heterosexist kind of place. And... It's been getting better with time as we've challenged old ideologies, but still that exists. But the core of so much of it is social class. Like this variable, this chapter is probably more important to the family than any other chapter because it gets to the core of life chances for a family, access to health and food and a nice car and a good house and a good school system with a good neighborhood, your socioeconomic status. And then, you know, your parents' socioeconomic status, the ones you're born in, and then the social class reproduction, and, you know, 
there's a whole lot to this chapter, but economics is the core of all of it. It's all about, you know, getting that money to get that medicine, I guess. It's like, you know, as for lack of better words, currently during this lecture a little bit. But again, that's the idea of how does a family access the ability to rise up the social class ladder? And your book talks about in terms of social mobility. And so, again, depending upon where your family is located in the social class system is then associated with people's overall health and educational attainment and all of that. Very, very important stuff because all that adds up to life chances for your family, which is totally associated with how long you live and the quality of life in general. Okay, so some theories of social class. So... Again, you can go back to ancient times and talk about when we first had a surplus and society began to specialize and then to divide labor into groups and depending upon the role you played was associated with where you were located in the social class ladder. And so you see thousands of years of history of the evolution of society and the dividing of labor and then the beginnings of exploitation of that labor by the owners to build capital and to build profit, okay? So you can think about society, and your book has a picture of a pyramid where, you know, the majority of the people are on the bottom, some in the middle, and a very few on top, okay? And so there's some arguments for why society is stratified into a class system, depending on you know, your location within which is depending upon socioeconomic status. But from a functionalist perspective, there's only so many elite social roles, okay? So we need like, you know, a set of challenges and socialization processes and, you know, merit and skill and ability and a filtering process to weed out those people so that the, be the ro top roles can be fulfilled by the best people. But then according to things like conflict theory, it says like, look guys, the top roles aren't Really, it's not a merit, meritocratic system. And just because you have the skill doesn't mean you'll ever have the opportunity to rise up the social class ladder. Those who are on top have been there for generations and have just been passing that down to their children. And symbolic interactionist perspective would say that we're the ones who built society. We're the ones who built a society of inequality. But you got to ask, is some inequality good? Okay. So again, if to be a doctor, you have to study for 20 straight years. Should a server who doesn't have to study maybe but a month or two and then, you know, slowly gain knowledge about food and alcohol a little bit here and there to survive, or if they're really big into it, become sommeliers and become masters. But again, should a restaurant waiter be paid the same as a doctor, which requires tons more skill and a lot of hard work? So that's the argument of like, should inequality exist? But again, whether or not inequality should exist, inequality does exist. And because inequality does exist, the inequality affects families differentially. So therefore, those families that are in a privileged position in the class system, they have more life chances than those that are in a non-privileged, that are more at the mercy of having to sell their labor to be able to survive in a capitalist system, for example, okay? So again, where your family is located in this class system is associated with life chances, and this is a very key theme, okay? But it's also associated with the culture you're socialized into. For so examples, you know, think about it. Does upper class culture raise their kids a little bit differently than lower class culture? They have a different type of vocabulary, a different way of dressing. And then, you know, are all those factors associated with how well you do in an interview and whether or not you had the skills to be able to get the job? And there's a lot of things here. And as I talked about in my last lecture, some of the saddest things about this is that you know, the neighborhood you grow up in is associated with your overall intelligence, your overall skills and knowledge, okay, whether it be fluid or crystallized intelligence, you know, your culture you're raised into and how hard you had to work at school to get through it. And all these factors are associated with your overall physical brain development and things like that. So the sad truth is, you know, again, as I talked in the last lecture, that you're parents' socioeconomic status, your socioeconomic status is totally associated with things like even brain growth and development and becoming the best person you can be. And so because we live in a society of inequality, those people that are in the bottom, that, you know, do they have as good of a chance as getting to the top as anybody else? And at first you want to say yes. But again, to be able to pass all the skill sets, to be able to knock out thousand page papers, you know, to be able to 
get through this system, you know, does it, is it harder if you're in poverty? But then you got to look at it like college degree rates. Why do people that go to universities get twice as many degrees as people that start out in a college, community college? And, you know, you got to ask some questions here. You know, is your family's socioeconomic status then associated with your overall life chances? And again, this is really hard stuff to look at because you realize that society is not fair. And you want life to be beautiful and rainbows, but the truth is it's not fair. And not every kid has a chance to grow up and develop. And some kids didn't go to a good school where they were challenged and developed the skills they needed to be able to get further in school. And this is all real world stuff. And it's really sad and dark and depressing that not every kid has a fair shot, but that's the truth of it. So again, in sociology, how can we make a system where everybody can have a fair shot, where we can reduce the effects of poverty upon childhood development and their ability to become that amazing person who's so smart that they can, merit, you know, on their merit, rise up the social class ladder? And how do we open the doors of society for even poor people to rise up based upon merit when they might not even be given a chance because they were poor to begin with? Stuff to think about. So again, socioeconomic status, I put SES, you see that a lot because uh, it's a long word that they tend to abbreviate it, okay? But really, that's just a measure of your social location within the class system. And again, the effect upon the socioeconomic status upon the family is very real. And again, when you start to delve into the effects of poverty upon the family, this is the kind of stuff we're talking about. You know, and then the differential cultural lifestyles between upper, middle, and lower classes. And then how those cultural lifestyles are associated with, you know, overall achievement and life chances, okay? And again, I put the equation in here that socioeconomic status is generally thought of, you know, education plus job plus wealth plus cultural capital and political power. But again, your cultural capital and political power built into that is your biological sex. Historically, males had more power. Your sexuality, historically, heterosexist or heterosexuals had more power. Or your religion, you know, historically, Protestant Christians in the United States had power. All of these all factor into your cultural and political capital or social capital, okay? So again, just a general breaking down of the class structure. Again, social classes themselves are arbitrary. Like, is 33,000 or less the lower class, 33 to 75 middle, and 75 to 125 upper middle, and, you know, over 125 is the upper class? Tons of ways that you can break out social classes, and that's why when you're operationalizing variables for doing studies, you get very clear boundaries that the middle class is defined as this range to this range, etc., but just generally, you can think of the elite class, the capitalist class, the 1%, the upper middle class, you know, 15% of the population, the middle class about 30%, lower class about 30%, lower middle class about, you know, 15 to 25%. Then you have your underclass of homeless, um, which is, again, a whole different topic here. Um, hopefully we can talk a bit about homelessness in the family because that's, <laughs> wow, it's about 10 lectures going on there. But again, that all ties into the idea of poverty. You know, how does poverty affect families? So again, your socioeconomic status determines your location within this class system that is generally thought of as kind of a pyramid. Uh, inequality between classes is increasing in modern times, so you are starting to see the decline of the middle class as the capitalist elites gain billions and billions and other people are going into debt. Um, social mobility in the United States is possible, but class reproduction is more likely, essentially, that if you're born into the lower class, your likelihood of staying in the lower class is pretty high. And again, that's because of the cultural attached to social class. So when you look at the association between culture and social class, and built into that again is your knowledge and values and ideologies and skills and you know vocabulary and all of that's built into it. And that all plays a way in whether or not you get the job. So poverty and social policy, again in the United States, it's been a slow process, but especially around the time of the Civil War and then into the activist days of the Industrial Revolution um, and then into the growing of the American bureaucratic government, you start to see increases in social policies. And at first, most people are going to jump to like welfare. And I'm just going to do a little tidbit about welfare because look, here's how it works. Rich people like welfare. Why do rich people like welfare? Because if you don't give some crumbs to the poor, okay, they will revolt and just take over society. And that's just the way it historically has always been. So over the years, you know, if 
if you don't, it's like the French Revolution was started by females who didn't have bread. So while Marie was e Marie Antoinette was eating cake, you know, the women of France were starving, and so were their children. So eventually, you know, they cut off the king and queen's head. And so, you know, without some kind of welfare to take care of the poor, to th it started out with orphans, okay, widows. And, you know, that's where, like, the first orphanages come from. The first social policies done by the government came from. Because during the Civil War, so many men were dying. They didn't want to sign up if they knew that their wives and families weren't taken care of. So you started to see this growth in the social policy to be able to take care of the underclass. But again, you know, in America, we're the, we are the 1%. When you look at the rest of the world, Americans make 20000 more than the next closest to, the, you know, the average American. And but again, when you kind of look at who actually owns most of that money, you know, again, you start to look at how the capitalist elite have the majority of the money so that those numbers are actually kind of skewed when you think about it. But still, America in general has more capital than the other country by like a third. OK, so to not have some sort of social policy to take care of the underclass be ridiculous, I would think, because in America, be, we can take care of the poor. We have the funds. We have the means to be able to do some of those programs, not saying that you don't need to motivate people. So again, having too much social programs, again, reduces the incentive. So you need a little bit of inequality, some incentivization to in, you know, in, in, encourage people to be able to go out and fulfill some of those social roles that take tons and tons of work, like being a doctor, don't get me wrong. But still, we need something because there are social problems that have to be recognized that are very real. And we also have to take care of each other because if we're not taking care of each other, you know, how does that affect everything? So, again, the it's a great discussion we could have about social policy um, and then the importance of social policy for families. Because what happens when, you know, the breadwinner dies, for example, and the other person has a bunch of kids and, you know, that kind of stuff is just a reality of being human. So we need some kind of social policies to be able to take care of families. And so please don't trash welfare because, you know, because just because of the negative connotation. So usually people use that argument and they start pointing fingers at groups. But recognize that welfare is an essential part of, you know, just a social policy in general to be able to take care of people that really actually truly do need taken care of. Okay, and in America, we have a lot to give. So it's great that we have a lot of social programs. In America, we have tons of social programs. So I, I've always thought that was one of the best things about our country. Um, but so the poverty line is drawn annually, and they just kind of update it based upon, you know, the percentage of people that are, you know, based upon the basic needs assessment, the percentage of people that, you know, aren't meeting that on that line okay and so it's just been it goes up a little bit every year generally because of inflation and things along those lines but so social programs exist for those in poverty um usually taxation is based upon progressive taxation that the more money you make the more taxes you end up having to pay out so people that don't like live make a lot of money tend to not pay as many taxes but you know again there's a lot of loopholes to that that we could go off about for days and one on other discussions about how the 1% maintain that wealth. But again, without a social policy, it would be crushing to families. And then if you crush families and put them in poverty, it increases all kinds of social problems like violence, abuse, rape, drug use, health decline. This all goes up when you have a large amounts of people in poverty. So it's important that we offer education for free to everybody and some food if you need it from a food bank, you know, and some things like that because you just people need help. And if you don't help people, you end up having major social problems like crime and everything goes through the roof, for example, okay? So poverty is associated with your social class location, race, ethnicity, as we talked about last time, how depending, you know, non-whites were restricted to the lower classes, non-Europeans were restricted to the lower classes, uh, sexual orientation, uh, biological sex, gender, age, mental health. Again, females historically were stuck in the lower classes. Check out the, you know, feminization of poverty if you guys are interested in that. Uh, gender identity in modern times. Uh, age, again, children and the elderly tend to have major uh, issues with poverty. Therefore, we really need social policies for the children and the elderly. Um, but the effect upon the poverty, uh, the effect of poverty upon the family is just devastating. Okay, 
again, when you stick entire pe people into poverty, all the risk factors for everything just go through the roof, okay? And so how does that affect the stability of the family? The family as an institution, according to functionalist theory. So inequality and that conflict that results, you know, is resulting in whole families being stuck in poverty, which is just incredibly sad. And so I think about one in five children are in poverty right now in America, for example. But again, think about housing and food insecurity. And then how does that affect the psychology of families and the inner workings of families? And is it stress? Does it impose stress upon families? But we live in a capitalist system. You can't just go out and hunt for your food everywhere, you know? I mean, all the land is privately owned. You have to go get a job. And, you know, in order to get a good job, you need that education and that wealth and that power. And so, again... You know, if you're stuck in poverty and you can't rise up the social class ladder, then you get susceptible to things like housing and food insecurity, living in not good neighborhoods, not having good school systems. And then the whole cycle repeats itself. OK, again, hence class reproduction, cultural reproduction, the association between class and cultural reproduction from generation to generation. So again, poverty is associated with educational attainment and job prestige because those coming out of poverty are less likely to get the college degrees, to get the jobs, to move on up. Not that that's the only way to get ahead in life, because again, only 35% of Americans have that. But again, that's how you, you know, these are the measures of how you rise up the social class ladder, okay? So social class and family and culture. Again, so educational attainment, um, less violence, less drug addiction, better health is associated with upper class families when compared to lower class families. Okay, so the upper class families, because of their life chances, are getting more access to education and jobs and wealth and cultural and social capital to rise up the social class ladder. So therefore, your social class location is associated with your overall life chances. And that means for your family itself, your family's socioeconomic status is then associated with the life chances for the members of your family. And your book does a diagram of all that. And it has like this great picture of like a, you know, a family and then all their social networks within the family and all the job positions within the family. And it shows you that it's a really good uh, thing in your book. Definitely check that out. Okay. So again, higher life chances for higher social classes. Again, more achievement due to ascribed status and socioeconomic status. So people that are higher up the social class ladder have more access to be able to do the achieved status because they are born with a scribe status. You know, start with some of those intro words. Um, the book talks about the culture of social classes, for example, and their attitudes toward educational attainment. Because how is your social class and the culture of your social class you know, how is that associated with your attitudes toward educational attainment? And it talks about how the middle class families are very focused on development and cultivating their children, whereas the working class, you know, families are just more happy with natural growth. and They don't really force their children to learn physics. OK, because when you study psychology of intelligence, that's where the brain growth comes from. It comes from the work. It comes from like having to sit down and do chemistry and physics and really hard math and really challenging English, you know, but then that's associated with your ACNT and SAT scores and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's again, how you rise up the social class ladder. So if you're born into a social class, into a culture, your family that doesn't have as high of educational aspirations for their children as like the middle class family or the upper class family, how is that associated with you rising up the social class ladder? So your future socioeconomic status of children is associated with your family's socioeconomic status. So if you kind of look at your parents' socioeconomic status and ask yourself, the likelihood is you're going to stay that way unless, again, you know, why are we here in college? We're here for money. We also want to do what we love. And then if we can make money doing what we love while rising up the social class ladder, <laughs> our, our families do well. All right, but the book does talk about how the 1% is consolidating more wealth in modern times. So how is that going to affect all families if just, just an elite class has all the capital and all of us, the proletariat, are stuck selling our labor at the mercy of the owners? So we'll see how that affects the family coming up in the future. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.